Section thirty seven. Part three of Chapter nine of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book one. Chapter nine. Part three. We are next to consider the surveyors of the highways. Every parish is bound of common rights to keep the high roads, that go through it, in good and sufficient repair, unless by reason of the tenure of lands, or otherwise this care is consigned to some particular private person. From this burden no man was exempt by our ancient laws, whatever other immunities he might enjoy, this being part of the trinoda necessitas, to which every man's estate was subject, viz. expeditio contra hostum, archium constructio, a pontium reparatio. For, though the reparation of bridges only is expressed, yet that of roads also must be understood, as in the Roman law, ad instructiones reparanisque eterum a pontium, nullum genus hominum, nullisca dignitatis ec venerationis meritus cesare oportet. And indeed now, for the most part, the care of the roads only seems to be left to parishes, that of bridges being in great measure devolved upon the county at large, by statute twenty two Henry the eighth c five. If the parish neglected these repairs, they might formerly, as they still may, be indicted for such their neglect. But it was not then incumbent upon any particular officer to call the parish together, and set them upon this work. For which reason, by the statute two and three p h and m c eight, surveyors of the highways were ordered to be chosen in every parish. These surveyors were, originally, according to the statute of Philip and Mary, to be appointed by the constable and church wardens of the parish, but now they are constituted by two neighbouring justices, out of such substantial inhabitants as have either ten pounds per annum of their own, or rent thirty pounds a year, or are worth in personal estate one hundred pounds. Their office and duty consists in putting in execution a variety of statutes for the repairs of the highways, that is, of ways leading from one town to another, by which it is enacted, one, that they may remove all annoyances in the highways, or give notice to the owner to remove them, who is liable to penalties on non-compliance. Two, they are to call together all the inhabitants of the parish, six days in every year, to labour in repairing on the highways, all persons, keeping draughts, or occupying lands, being obliged to send a team for every draught, and for every fifty pounds a year, which they keep or occupy, and all other persons to work or find a labourer. The work must be completed before harvest, as well for providing a good road for carrying in the corn, as also because all hands are then supposed to be employed in harvest work. And every cartway must be made eight feet wide at the least, and may be increased by the quarter sessions to the breadth of four and twenty feet. The surveyors may lay out their own money in purchasing materials for repairs, where there is not sufficient within the parish, and shall be reimbursed by a rate, to be allowed at a special sessions. 4. In case the personal labour of the parish be not sufficient, the surveyors, with the consent of the quarter sessions, may levy a rate, not exceeding six pence in the pound, on the parish, in aid of the personal duty, for the due application of which they are to account upon oath. As for turnpikes, which are now universally introduced in aid of such rates, and the law relating to them, these depend entirely on the particular powers granted in the several road acts, and therefore have nothing to do with this compendium of general law. I proceed, therefore, lastly, to consider the overseers of the poor, their original appointment and duty. The poor of England, till the time of Henry the Eighth, subsisted entirely upon private benevolence, and the charity of well-disposed Christians. For though it appears by the mirror, that by the common law the poor were to be sustained by parsons, rectors of the church, and the parishioners, so that none of them die for default of substance, and though by the statutes 12 Richard the Second c. 7, and 19 Henry the Seventh c. 12, the poor are directed to be sustained in cities or towns wherein they were born, or such wherein they had dwelt for three years, which seem to be the first rudiments of parish settlements, Yet till the statute twenty seven Henry the eighth c twenty six, I find no compulsory method chalked out for this purpose. But the poor seem to have been left to such relief as the humanity of their particular neighbours would afford them. The monasteries were, in particular, their principal resource, and among other bad effects which attended the monastic institutions, it was not perhaps one of the least, though frequently esteemed quite otherwise, that they supported and fed a very numerous and very idle poor 
whose sustenance depended upon what was daily distributed in alms at the gates of the religious houses. But upon the total dissolution of these, the inconvenience of this encouraging the poor in habits of indolence and beggary was quickly felt throughout the kingdom, and abundance of statutes were made in the reign of King Henry the Eighth for providing for the poor and impotent, which the preambles to some of them recite, had of late years strangely increased. These poor were principally of two sorts, sick and impotent, and therefore unable to work, idle and sturdy, and therefore able, but not willing, to exercise any honest employment. To provide in some measure for both of these, in and about the metropolis, his son Edward the Sixth founded three royal hospitals, Christ's and St. Thomas's, for the relief of the impotent through infancy or sickness, and Bridewell for the punishment and employment of the vigorous and idle. But these were far from being sufficient for the care of the poor throughout the kingdom at large, and therefore, after many other fruitless experiments, by statute 43 Elizabeth C. II, overseers of the poor were appointed in every parish. By virtue of the statute last mentioned, these overseers are to be nominated yearly in Easter week, or within one month after, by two justices dwelling near the parish. They must be substantial householders, and so expressed to be in the appointment of the justices. Their office and duty, according to the same statute, are principally these. First, to raise competent sums for the necessary relief of the poor, impotent, old, blind, and such other, being poor and not able to work, and secondly, to provide work for such as are able, and cannot otherwise get employment. But this latter part of their duty, which according to the wise regulations of that salutary statute, should go hand in hand with the other, is now most shamefully neglected. However, for these joint purposes they are empowered to make and levy rates upon the several inhabitants of the parish, by the same act of Parliament, which has been farther explained and enforced by several subsequent statutes. The two great objects of this statute seem to have been, one, to relieve the impotent poor, and them only, two, to find employment for such as are able to work, and this principally by providing stocks to be worked up at home, which perhaps might be more beneficial than accumulating all the poor in one common workhouse, a practice which tends to destroy all domestic connections, the only felicity of the honest and industrious labourer, and to put the sober and diligent upon a level, in point of their earnings, with those who are dissolute and idle. Whereas, if none were to be relieved but those who are incapable to get their livings, and that in proportion to their incapacity, if no children were to be removed from their parents, but such as are brought up in rags and idleness, and if every poor man and his family were employed whenever they requested it, and were allowed the whole profits of their labour, a spirit of cheerful industry would soon diffuse itself through every cottage. Work would become very easy and habitual, when absolutely necessary to their daily subsistence, and the most indigent peasant would go through his task without a murmur, if assured that he and his children, when incapable of work through infancy, age, or infirmity, would then, and then only, be entitled to support from his opulent neighbours. This appears to have been the plan of the statute of Queen Elizabeth, in which the only defect was confining the management of the poor to small parochial districts, which are frequently incapable of furnishing proper work, or providing an able director. However, the laborious poor were then at liberty to seek employment wherever it was to be had, none being obliged to reside in the places of their settlement, but such as were unable or unwilling to work, and those places of settlement being only such where they were born, or had made their abode, originally, for three years, and afterwards, in the case of vagabonds, for one year only. After the Restoration, a very different plan was adopted, which has rendered the employment of the poor more difficult, by authorizing the subdivision of parishes, has greatly increased their number, by confining them all to their respective districts, has given birth to the intricacy of our poor laws, by multiplying and rendering more easy the methods of gaining settlements, and in consequence has created an infinity of expensive lawsuits between contending neighborhoods concerning those settlements and removals. By the statute 13 and 14, Charles the Second, c. 12, a legal settlement was declared to be gained by birth, inhabitancy, apprenticeship, or service for forty days, within which period all intruders were made removable from any parish by two justices of the peace, unless they settled in a tenement of the annual value of ten pounds. The frauds, naturally consequence upon this provision, which gave a settlement by so short a residence, produced the statute first james the second c seventeen which directed notice in writing to be delivered to the parish officers before a settlement could be gained by such residents 
Subsequent provisions allowed other circumstances of notoriety to be equivalent to such notice given, and those circumstances have from time to time been altered, enlarged, or restrained, whenever the experience of new inconveniences, arising daily from new regulations, suggested the necessity of a remedy. And the doctrine of certificates was invented, by way of counterpoise, to restrain a man and his family from acquiring a new settlement by any length of residence whatever, unless in two particular accepted cases, which makes parishes very cautious of giving such certificates, and of course confines the poor at home, where frequently no adequate employment can be had. The law of settlements may be therefore now reduced to the following general heads, or a settlement in a parish may be acquired, one, by birth, which is always prima facie the place of settlement, until some other can be shown. This is also always the place of settlement of a bastard child, for a bastard, having in the eye of the law no father, cannot be referred to his settlement, as other children may. But in legitimate children, though the place of birth be prima facie the settlement, yet it is not conclusively so, for there are, two settlements by parentage, being the settlement of one's father or mother, all children being really settled in the parish where their parents are settled, until they get a new settlement for themselves. A new settlement may be acquired several ways, as, 3. By marriage. For a woman, marrying a man that is settled in another parish, changes her own, the law not permitting the separation of husband and wife. But if the man be a foreigner, and has no settlement, hers is suspended during his life, if he be able to maintain her, but after his death she may return again to her old settlements. The other methods of acquiring settlements in any parish are all reducible to this one, of forty days' residence therein. But this forty days' residence, which is construed to be lodging or lying there, must not be by fraud, or stealth, or in any clandestine manner, but accompanied with one or the other of the following concomitant circumstances. The next method, therefore, of gaining settlement is, for, by forty days' residence and notice. For if a stranger comes into a parish, and delivers notice in writing of his place of abode and number of his family, to one of the overseers, which must be read in the church and registered, and resides there unmolested for forty days after such notice, he is legally settled thereby. For the law presumes that such a one, at the time of notice, is not likely to become chargeable, else he would not venture to give it, or that, in such case, the parish would take care to remove him. But there are also other circumstances equivalent to such notice. Therefore, 5. Renting for a year a tenement of the yearly value of ten pounds, and residing forty days in the parish, gains a settlement without notice, upon the principle of having substance enough to gain credit for such a house. 6. Being charged to and paying the public taxes and levies of the parish, and 7. Executing any public parochial office for a whole year in the parish, as churchwarden, etc., are both of them equivalent to notice, and gain a settlement, when coupled with a residence of forty days. 8. Being hired for a year, when unmarried, and serving a year in the same service. And 9. Being bound an apprentice for seven years, give the servant and apprentice a settlement, without notice, in that place wherein they serve the last forty days. This is meant to encourage application to trades, and going out to reputable services. 10. Lastly, the having an estate of one's own, and residing thereon forty days, however small the value may be, in case it be acquired by act of law of a third person, as by descent, gift, device, etc., is a sufficient settlement. But if a man acquire it by his own act, as purchase, in its popular sense, in consideration of money paid, then unless the consideration advance, bona fide, be thirty pounds, it is no settlement for any longer time, than the person shall inhabit thereon. He is in no case removable from his own property, but he shall not, by any trifling or fraudulent purchases of his own, acquire a permanent and lasting settlement. All persons, not so settled, may be removed to their own parishes, on complaint of the overseers, by two justices of the peace, if they shall adjudge them likely to become chargeable to the parish, into which they have intruded, unless they are in a way of getting a legal settlement, as by having hired a house of ten pounds per annum, or living in an annual service, for then they are not removable. And in all other cases, if the parish to which they belong will grant them a certificate, acknowledging them to be their parishioners, they cannot be removed merely because likely to become chargeable, but only when they become actually chargeable. 
but such certificated persons can gain no settlement by any of the means above mentioned, unless by renting a tenement of ten pounds per annum, or by serving an annual office in the parish, being legally placed therein, neither can an apprentice or servant to such certificated person gain a settlement by such their service. These are the general heads of the laws relating to the poor, which by the parishioners of the courts of justice thereon within a century past are branched into great variety. And yet notwithstanding the pains that has been taken about them all, they still remain very imperfect, and inadequate to the purposes they are designed for, a fate that has generally attended most of our statute laws, where they have not the foundation of the common law to build on. When the shires, the hundreds, and the tithings were kept in the same admirable order that they were disposed in by the great Alfred, there were no persons idle, consequently none but the impotent that needed relief, and the statute of forty-third Elizabeth seems entirely founded on the same principle. But when this excellent scheme was neglected and departed from, we cannot but observe with concern what miserable shifts and lame expedients have from time to time been adopted, in order to patch up the flaws occasioned by this neglect. There is not a more necessary or a more certain maxim in the frame and constitution of society than that every individual must contribute his share, in order to the well-being of the community, and surely they must be very deficient in sound policy, who suffer one half of a parish to continue idle, dissolute, and unemployed, and then form visionary schemes, and at length are amazed to find that the industry of the other half is not able to maintain the whole. End of section 37